Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, The Tough Girl girl tribe just want to say a massive thank you for all of your support over the past few months and years i really do appreciate your support the tough girl podcast would not be where it is today without your contributions it really does make such a massive difference so a big big thank you and a big thank you to to all of my patrons the 267 patrons at the moment we're super close to getting to 270 patrons and then fingers crossed 300 patrons by either um, august or by the end of the year if you are thinking about supporting the tough girl podcast please sign up sign up from two dollars a month five dollars a month ten dollars a month whatever it is that you can afford every single month it makes such a massive difference but now let's listen to the tough girl podcast episode today i'm excited that we're going to be speaking with melanie vogel who is an explorer and is currently through hiking canada from the atlantic ocean to the arctic ocean and then heading down to the pacific ocean following the great trail which is twenty four thousand kilometers Mel has been walking for over two and a half years now. It is an incredible story. Mel's going to start by sharing more about where she grew up. I'm originally from Carmens, which is close by Dresden. And um, I pretty much grew up there until I studied and then moved to Dresden to study and work. And I uh, worked about five years before I decided that I do not want to live in Germany anymore. So I was looking around to see where do I want to go. There were this possibility of the work and travel visa, which uh, a lot of countries across the world are offering. And I was already over 30 and most of these visas actually uh, only uh, permitted you to travel, work and travel until 30 except for Canada. So I decided to go to Canada and I talked with friends who went to Vancouver for traveling and they told me, check out Vancouver. It's pretty, it's pretty good over there. (laughs) It's a beautiful area in British Columbia. And so I immigrated to Canada in 2008. I moved to Vancouver after I took a vacation in 2007 and shortly after I quit my job, I, I canceled my, my lease and, and I went. And pretty much shor- shortly after receiving my permanent residency in 2011, I went low budget backpacking in Asia, Australia and New Zealand for almost two years. And I started my journey uh, by traveling five months through India until my visa expired then went into uh, Nepal, hiked the Annapurna base camp, drove an old Russian Minsk motorbike for two months through Vietnam, and then went all the way through China, all the way up to uh, Mongolia, where I lived with a nomad family for nine days. And it was a good time, and it was a tough time, and the experiences all together were pretty amazing. So by the end of my trip, I first returned to Germany and then went back to Vancouver where I had lived and I wanted to settle there again. The reason why I came back was that I felt I had to come back. And when I did, I asked myself, why did I come back? I really struggled I, uh, because I only realized by returning to um, my old world how much I had actually changed, how my outlook on life had changed and how my, my values had changed. So uh, I went ahead and I continued to embrace my minimal lifestyle and try to have as much of a small footprint as possible. I banned the word busy out of my vocabulary and I do this to this date. <laughs> I, um, I rebelled. I rebelled against the materialism in our Western world, even though it's kind of worldwide, if, you, if I'm ready to be honest. And, um, and I was depressed. I felt stuck. I didn't see myself move forward anymore. And I would sit in the sky train, for example, see the mountains in the distance, 
had tears in my eyes and, and, and promising myself that one day I will be there. And I think um, it was libraries and, and to this day, I, I love libraries. And back then, the, the library was my haven. And the books nurtured my dreams and, and it gave me moments of peace to my struggling mind. And it was the time um, when I visited the library quite a lot, almost every day. And I read an article about the Trans Canada Trail. And back then I didn't know that one day I actually will hike that entire trail. And uh, um, yeah, that that's kind of how the the idea or how the trail even started to become um, an information that somehow sat in the unconscious in the back of my mind. Um, then not seeing any betterment of my situation, I decided to leave Vancouver. I, I bought a ticket and took my few belongings and my bicycle on a train to Toronto. And of course, there was everything was new. It felt almost like I was on a honeymoon. I loved cycling around, discovering the many neighborhoods. I felt a new energy. I found temporary jobs. I volunteered. I made friends. I wrote morning pages. I went to ecstatic dance sessions. And it felt like I recovered somewhat. But in all honesty, I still wasn't really good. Be, because be, be, behind all this new euphoria was still a very fragile, often lonely, self-doubting person. And it was at the beginning of July in 2016 when I made that major decision in my tiny little shoebox apartment in Toronto. And I made it just like that. I will hike across Canada. And that wasn't a moment that solved all my problems but it made them all more bearable from then on. It was a decision that gave my life a new drive and a, a new sense of purpose. And making that decision felt like a long exhale. As it seemed, I had stopped breathing deeply since my return from my last journey. So um, this was the day my journey pretty much started. I broke the news to my family and um, and the re response I got was actually a nice surprise. They said we were just waiting for it. And I think it did not come to, for a surprise to them because they saw me suffering ever since I returned from my last journey. They saw that I was never really satisfied being settled. But when they heard, of course, that I will walk across Canada about such a ginormous wild country, they did have concerns and my mom wasn't happy. <laughs> and we had a few long conversations in which I spoke about trust and that they need to believe me like or believe in me and my ability to take responsibility, which I had proven in so many other projects and, and so many other times and other travels that I have done before. It took me about one year, 11 months, one year to uh, prepare for this journey. And that year was an up and down, like on a roller coaster. <laughs> I remember I was sitting in the passenger seat of my friend one day and I would cry and, and complain somehow that, that I have this feeling that, that nobody helps me, that I'm doing this all alone. And his answer back then was, Melanie, this is your journey. And it was a really tough response. But I knew right away that he was right. So the thing is this, what seemed like a problem today was a solution the next day. Then I seemed I don't get help. There was help the next day. If I seemed I'm not succeeding in anything, I succeeded, maybe not the next day, but eventually. And uh, there are good examples for this when, for example, um, I applied for sponsorships and there were so many no's because I did not have enough experience or I did not have enough followers on social media. And then it could happen that I would send out a request in the evening and there was a yes already in the morning. 
or I had problems to find um, someone. I actually had the problem to ask someone to, to uh, take care of my gear, to send it to me when, when it's needed, because I don't have family in Canada. And I, uh, my, my friends, because I only, by the time I uh, prepared for this journey, my friendships were pretty uh, new. So I didn't want to put such a burden on someone. And I remember I was in an outdoor store and I met um, a woman over there. Her name is Olivia. And we chatted. And so I talked to her about my journey, uh, journey and what I'm planning. And um, she's super outdoorsy. And I think we, sh- we were two hours, spent two hours in this, uh, in this store chatting. And so I would eventually also say, yeah, one of my problems is that I do not have anyone who takes care of my gear. And she would say, I do it. I didn't even know her back then. And she did. And this was also an experience that I had very, very many times in this journey that there were like that everything would just somehow fall in place. Suddenly people would step into my life and offer support, somehow in helping hand. And all the support come, came always in the right time and I learned how quickly two strangers actually can become friends besides that I had also to face a lot of reactions most of what I heard like most common reaction was that I'm crazy so uh, fair enough I can deal with that but I also heard things like that I'm irresponsible because I'm over 40. I'm actually 44 right now. And things like this, like journeys like this, you do in your 20s because when you're older, then you have normally family and or a career or, you know, other things in your life you have. So, so exploring is more something for young people. Like comments like this were a little harder to swallow. And then there were like those comments where people just looked at me in disbelief. And I have to be honest, like sometimes when I talked in the very beginning about what I'm going to do, it sounded even strange to myself. Like when people would say, but you know how how big Canada is, right? (laughs) And we have really hard, harsh winters. And I'm like, yeah, I do because I'm preparing for it. Sometimes it was just the way that people looked at me that made me instantly so insecure. And then I think I started to, to struggle in my conversations and that vanished because I studied and I researched and I learned about the trail and I learned about gear and ultralight gear. I didn't know that. So that was a whole new research for me. And I read about other hiker stories. I watched movies. I learned basic survival skills. And with all that knowledge that I gained, I became more confident in my conversations. And I, because also I could give m- more clear answers to the questions I received. And I could be more steadfast in, yeah, yeah, that's, that's how it will be. And yes, um, I knew the the trail is like uh, 24,000 kilometers long. Would I do everything, uh, all of it? No, that wasn't the plan in the beginning. I do remember also a a moment where, for example, in that survival meetup that I attended, that organizer, he would say it a few times, but he said it one day so so serious that he really thought (laughs) it's stupid that I'm going on such a journey because he was very experienced with extreme environments and he made it really sound in this conversation that I will not be able to succeed. I never attended that meetup again, which was a shame. But back then I was already so tired to, uh, I think, to constantly defend my decision and on how I want to spend my life. And I wondered why people can trust me or why can they not just think that yes, you can do it. And I I asked myself, is this because I'm a woman? But now that I'm further in this journey, I actually think because 
back then I didn't even trust myself. I had so many fears and I had so many doubts because I didn't grow up in, the, in Canada's climate and I did not have experience so much with Canada's outdoors. So, um, you know, sometimes what we shine, this is how, per, how people perceive us. And I think that was the very reason that he could not believe in me back then. So what I learned over the course of my preparation is that when I, like with the skills I gained and with the information I gathered and that I became a little stronger already. And I learned that knowledge is indeed power and that it helped me to manifest my own belief and my trust that indeed I will walk across Canada. And the final act to seal the deal was when I booked my flight ticket to Newfoundland, where I then started my journey on June 2nd in 2017, which is now two and a half years ago. Actually, one of the things I'd love to go into a little bit more is around this sort of the, the human element. So you've talked about people's responses to this, your dream of how you want to live your life, you know, the choices that you've made as people thinking that you're crazy, that you're irresponsible. They sort of look at you in disbelief. They may think that you're, you know, that you're stupid. But what has it been like on the trail? Like how have the human interactions gone I may meet, meet people on the trail who are cycling and walking themselves, who are instantly intrigued in my story. But then you meet also people in their communities who are not so much outdoorsy and who carry a lot of fears themselves. And that's often people who then will project their own fears onto me that I have to deal with then. And where I have to distinguish what is useful here that's been said and what isn't. And I had to learn to choose my people to which I want to listen. And it's often really those people who, uh, who spend much more time in the outdoors who will then tell me, don't worry about the bears. While a person who's not so outdoorsy who will, will often have already a horror story available, that person will tell you that story and um and I'm I'm wondering sometimes what the purpose is of telling me such stories or why would they project such a fear onto me because um like what what's the purpose is the reason to tell me you better go home <laughs> which I want you know but um in general people all along the tra trail like from Newfoundland until here now in Kurdish Columbia have been incredible like helpful. I've been invited in so many homes. I have gotten so much support in, in all possible ways, actually. That could have happened when my, my wagon broke down or now that I have Malo, someone would watch my dog so I can go to the supermarket without worries that, you know, leaving my dog in front of the door. Really, the, the, the help came in, in all different kind of forms, from all different kind of people, with all different kind of backgrounds. Um, I stayed uh, in First Nation communities. I stayed with rich people and not so rich people, with people of different cultures. And it's so interesting. You are learning so much. People always tell me that they feel inspired by my journey, but there are so many people out there who inspire me with their journeys. With, and, and with their lives and how they approach certain things the way the way they do. So it's really a give and take. And I always think when we are open with each other, we will always learn something from each other. You've been on the road now for, for two and a half years. How are you paying to do this adventure? How are you affording to be out on the road for this length of time? And how are you funding this adventure? What you're just asking me is, a lot of times people are asking me this, a lot of people are asking me this question as well. And not just about money, but about time. So everyone is like, oh, you're living the dream. And like, where do you take the time? Or I don't have that time. I don't have that money. I don't have any means to do what you're doing. And I think these are just excuses for living that dream, like my dream, because to achieve like my goal or this dream, however you call that, is 
that I had to set my priorities straight and that I had to define what matters to me most. Um, as I told you earlier, I already um, lived a very minimal lifestyle after my past travels, and I really like that. I don't like to have a lot of stuff. So I'm not going out to shop. I'm not going spending my time to buy things. Every time in my life when I had a goal, I would very precisely work and save towards this goal. So often I explain to people when they ask me, how can I afford this? I will ask, like, how can you afford your car? How can you afford your house? You work and you save for it. Traveling is my priority. And most of my money is going towards this journey. Or when I'm done with this journey, towards my next journey. So I have to figure out like how to make that work. I work two part-time jobs. I didn't earn a lot of money, to be honest. I reached out to sponsors. I set up a GoFundMe page, which I did not do initially, but people started to reach out to me saying they want to support my journey. So I did it. As a German, this is not a very common thing you would do as a German or people would do in Germany, like funding someone who is traveling across the country. I don't think so. Over here in North America, there is a different kind of of giving and people are often happy to give. I had so many people stopping in their way, like stopping by car or stopping on the trail and handed me maybe $20 or even more to say, put this towards your next meal. People would stop and give me food. Like there's all kinds of things are happening in the journey itself, not even by saving up beforehand. I did also apply with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society for their expedition grants and received the women's expedition grant last year, which also helped me to offset some costs. And then it really comes down to budgeting and living on a very like living on that very low budget that you have. So, um, for example, I'm saving a lot of money when people are hosting me to have that warm meal or to have that bed or the shower, I could never afford to book myself constantly in a motel. But the kindness of people along the trail is giving this me this opportunity to rest up and to clean up and to have a better sleep for a night. So these kind of things are happening. In the in the end it's it's what is our priorities in life and and how do we want to spend our monies and focus on that. You know, don't get distracted. Like, don't just buy something because that looks good <laughs> or it looks like it makes me happy. No, my, my money just went straight to gear for the project. It went to uh, to the food. And then I have to pay for my emergency beacon, a monthly plan. Then there is my smartphone. These are actually my emergency beacon and my f- smartphone are the only two uh, payments that I have to make regularly. Other than this, there there is not much. Once you have your gear and you have a few savings for food, then you're good to go. (laughs) The good thing with this journey is also it's just within one country. I do not need to worry about visas. I didn't I you know I'm not traveling between countries. I don't have these kind of extra costs. I don't need to fly somewhere. I don't well, I flew to Newfoundland in the beginning, but there's no no extra costs than really just the shelter and food. I'd love to know more about like your body in terms of like the physicality of doing what you're doing day after day, walking these miles. And are, are you pulling a cart as well? I do now. Do you know? I yeah. So actually, that's interesting because before I started, I actually thought that I'm fit, that this will be no problem for me. I cycled all the time. I ran. I did other sports. I was a very uh, active person, but I think I underestimated the weight of my backpack. And I wasn't trained to carry my backpack every day, 60 pounds on my back. And so I did suffer. And the very beginning, I suffered so much. Um, My hips were sore. My shoulders were sore. My heels were sore. By the end of the day, I couldn't walk anymore. I walked like a robot because my joints got so stiff and my hips were shaved and bruised. They looked dark until 
until this day. It has never completely healed anymore. I grew um, calcium on my bones, so my body started to protect itself. I had a lot of blisters in the beginning too. It'd be um, the harsh gravel road, uh, the harsh gravel trail I walked on, or maybe the shoes. Maybe it wasn't the right socks. I don't know. I had blisters on top of blisters. So, um, but eventually these kind of things change because you, your body starts adapting. Um, I was always a skinny person or slim person. And so I didn't lose a lot of weight, but I felt after some time I became leaner. Do you know how many shoes you've walked, you've gone through? I didn't make the count yet. I think about eight by now. I, I do have to say that not all boots I walk to the end until they're completely gone. Sometimes I change boots because season changes and I just need a new pair. But the pair that I have is already so worked down that there is no, no need to send this back to my friend to store it for the next season. I will just let it go. So by saying that, about eight boots or hiking shoes. I, have, I wear both depending on the season. I mean, talking about the season, Canada's winters are notorious and the, <laughs> and it can get down to ridiculous degrees of cold, like minus 30, minus 40 with wind chill and all, and all that jazz. How was your first winter out on the trail? My first winter on the trail was pretty interesting because I still had so much fear of camping in the cold. So what I did is something really stupid. I walked myself almost to exhaustion because I just couldn't convince myself to put the tent down and to go to sleep in below minus 20. I actually thought that if I close my eyes, I'm, I'm not waking up anymore. Um, I once walked until 4 a.m. in the morning until finally I decided to put my tent down and I only fell asleep when the sun came up and the warmth of the sun shone a little bit on the t on my tent. So in the first winter, I was almost desperate that people would host me. Because the thing on the East Coast is that the winters are not only cold, but the humidity is very high. So it's really a cold that also creeps into your bones. It's not like here where the winters are very cold, like minus 40 degree, but they are very dry. So that was already a difference to now. I remember this one time when I was in Quebec because it was uh, in the provinces of New Brunswick and Quebec when winter hit me. And I started winter camping in the backyard of a couple that hosted me. And we talked a long time because those two, they went for a winter camping trip and they uh, had plenty of good advice. I just thought I may just be able to wing it. But winter camping is not just like that you can wing it. So I camped in the backyard of this couple's backyard and I couldn't sleep all day, all night. It was so cold. My face was so cold. And I'm, I was thinking, like, what are, what are these ex polar explorers are doing? Are they wearing goggles at night? Like, how do they keep warm? I put, like, um, these warm pads into, into my socks and really nothing helped. Like, I still felt these shivers coming through. And then now, three winters later... I can tell you so many mistakes I've done back then. First of, of the mistakes was that I had a, that I traveled with a free season 10 because I was kind of cheap. I thought I just kind of wing it with a free season tent. And you may be able to wing that in with a free season tent if there's cold if it's cold, but not extremely cold. Because a free season tent allows too much airflow getting under your tent and into your tent. So you will it will be much colder. So over time, I I actually changed a lot of things in in my approach, in my gear. Um, I have a expedition tent now. I have a minus forty sleeping bag now, and even with that sleeping bag, I have a second one that I that I will have with me, like my summer sleeping bag and the expedition bag. I doubled up with my sleeping pads, so I have two. It was last winter when it went down to minus 40 when the polar vortex came through when I was in Manitoba that actually I, I called one of these explorers and told me, like, how can I, even how can I make my winter camping more efficient? By then I had already gathered so much experience, but I wanted to be better. I wanted to, to improve setting up 
and taking down because that's actually the critical time when I got cold. So he gave me some advice and he also gave me some good advice that kind of helped me to free myself a little bit because when you walk or when you hike, there will be so many people who tell you you have to do that. Like their idea of what you should carry, how much you should carry, how you should camp, all these kind of things. And all this starts becoming a big mess in your head. And he said, you know what? I don't care what people are telling me. If I want to have a free letter pot in winter, I will have that free letter pot in winter. Back then I still had my one letter pot because a free letter pot is too bulky and heavy. He would tell me, you know, I'm really sick and tired. We had that conversation about Nescafe, like the instant coffee, which by then I drank for one and a half years and got really tired of. And he said, I have a coffee press. <laughs> I'm like, huh, okay. And I started to allow myself more comfort. I bought myself a pillow, like a travel pillow that I use in my tent. I bought myself a bigger pod, which is so much easier in winter. I, I bought myself a lot of things that made winter traveling really comfortable. And um, it is still a challenge to this day to, to camp below minus 30 it, because it is cold. Every explorer who's out there, and that was also good for me to know that people would tell me then, no, I'm cold. It's not that we're like just be warm in our tent in, in minus 40, minus 30 degree. No, everyone will experience the cold um, because it is. It's, so now that I have Malo, a lot of things change though. Like last year when I traveled through Manitoba, I also got a sponsorship uh, from Buff and Boots, which is like a down suit, like a down jacket and down pants. And they made sitting in my tent, eating, um, going for a pee, working around my, my tent when I set it up and take it down. Or when I'm on my breaks, when I'm walking in the real cold, it makes them so much more comfortable because I just put it on and I'm warm. So all this doesn't work right now because I have a dog now. Um, I met Malo last year on the trail in, in March. Warmer days were coming. So, uh, and I'm, I'm not feeling comfortable to, to be with him all day on the road, day after day, in minus 40 degree. So right now, while the cold spell came through over here, we were actually hosted, me and Malo, and... <laughs> Because I do have the gear and I have gear for Malo. I have booties for him. I have a vest for him. And I feel like I, I'm responsible not for myself anymore, but for him as well. Tell me more about Malo. When did you when did you get him? Why did you decide to get him? How did that happen? And what's it been like traveling with your fabulous dog? I met Malo on the crowing trail in Manitoba. And that was in March last year. I was walking actually with someone who hosted me. He came with me for the day and Malo came running towards us and then he walked all day with us and he was so cute and he was so awesome. And we were like, what are we doing with this dog? And we thought, okay, the best thing is to bring it back to the point where he came running at us. And I knocked on people's homes and got the responses that people don't know the dog. So we took him home, still contemplating what to do. What is the right thing to do? And um, the family said they will look locally if someone is uh, making a like a notice missing dog, maybe in a supermarket or around town. But nobody did. And I uh, looked on uh, social media and um, someone checked uh, the Winnipeg Humane Society for me and nobody claimed the dog. So, uh, And I have to be honest, I looked about almost four weeks and I got more anxious that maybe really someone will miss that dog because by that time I had already fallen in love with him. And I wanted to give this time still to myself because, and there again, I had a long conversation with my mom about it, who said, Melanie, you love your independent life so much and you want to go for so many more adventures. Think about that. Take your time to think about it. And she was right. And that was a little bit of, a worry that I had, but love wins. <laughs> 
seriously, love Vince and he sneaks himself so much in my heart that I'm like, okay, I can, I, whatever it takes, I will adapt my life to accompany you as my new companion. And it came with a lot of challenges uh, in this journey. Dogs would attack him. Like not every host family would accept a dog. While others would have no problems with dogs, sometimes it was even Malu who made that connection um, that people would host us because they walked with their dog. And then it was his behavior. It's my first dog. I never had a dog. And suddenly there was this dog who was apparently never on a leash and is pretty stubborn and so excited about new smells and everything he explores that there was a point when it seemed like everything added up and I cried. And there were people just that day when that happened, a car drove by, stopped, a family stepped out who had hosted me before. And they saw me and they asked me, like, can we help you somehow with anything? And all I needed in this moment was a hug. <laughs> That's what I'm asking for. That's all I was asking for. And so we hugged and I moved on and it felt a little lighter. And over time, the more I walked with him, slowly, slowly, Malu started to, to listen better. Our relationship became easier. Despite all these challenges we may have, sometimes I always say it's the best gift the trail has given me. What's the plan for, for this year and when do you expect to finish the hike? Currently, I'm in Fort Nelson, which is on the Alaska Highway. The Alaska Highway is part of the trail. I'm making my way now to the Yukon in the Northwest Territories and will hopefully reach in the next few months mile zero point in Taktiak Tak, which is at the Arctic Ocean. And from there, I will go to the Pacific Ocean because there will be the mile zero point in Victoria on Vancouver Island where I eventually will finish this journey. I'm not sure when I will finish it, though. I had many end dates in this journey. <laughs> Originally, I planned it will take two years. Then I thought it may take two and a half years. Now, it, when I applied for my grant, I said it will take three years, but really, uh, I don't know anymore. It will for sure take three and a half years. <laughs> so I decided now I will just arrive when I arrive. There is no need for setting a timeline. Um, I will go with the flow. Mel, how do you share your journey? How can people follow along? How can they be involved with, with what your life is like on a daily basis? Um, I'm blogging on uh, Facebook under Between Sunsets, A Trail Story. Um, I also update Instagram and Twitter the same way uh, under Between Sunsets. And uh, I do have a website, betweensunsets.com, but it's... the. <laughs> The blogging on that page is a little slow <laughs> because it becomes a little little much because I'm so often in out in nature. I, I don't want to spend my time too much online. So yeah, but that's where I that's where I blog. Mel, I'd love for you to share some advice and top tips for other women out there who want to take on their own challenge or adventure. Maybe not you know, a solo through hike across Canada, coast to coast to coast on, on the Great Trail, but, you know, want to do something that, that challenges them, what advice would you have? I think it doesn't matter what you're dreaming about. The most important step, for my opinion, is that you need to make your mind up and then commit. Think only when, you, when you're 100% committed, then everything will fall in place. and. And you have to trust that, like no matter what. You have to trust yourself because there will be always ways to make your dream possible in one way or another. Maybe you have to go off a little bit. Maybe you have to take some sideways. Maybe you have to take detours. Maybe there are challenges and setbacks, but never get discouraged. There is always a solution to everything. And if things like sometimes when moments get hard like, and you don't know anymore, you become unsure, stop. Not stop completely. That's not what I mean. But there is um, the word stop in, in the outdoors is used to stop, think, observe and plan and then move again. 
and because we are we, we always do everything so fast and we are almost trying to outrun ourselves but don't do that and especially when you are in that moment not even ready to run sometimes a good sleep a new day a warm meal or a fresh mind do wonder so what seems struggle today may not be a struggle tomorrow the failure you 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 make today is a, is a good experience tomorrow because in the meantime you will have reflected on it and learned from it what's also important is to take the time to celebrate achievements and to appreciate how far you have come not just in the distance of your journey but how far you have come as a human and i do think it's it's very important to choose your people like to choose whom you want to listen to there will be a lot of people out there who will want to give you their free advice and with all free things not everything not all of these free things are useful and focus i i had to learn this in my journey because um especially in very long journeys like when your when your goal is so far away there is this temptation that you may get easily distracted and distraction will blur your vision and it will mess with your mind i really do speak from experience here and so you have to learn and that's what i had to learn is patience and have an open communication because i think that and perseverance of course will get you anywhere so stay positive no matter what because when you shine the world will be a little brighter and warmer all around you and one final word we need to stop wanting to protect women and young people from discovering i know there is a lot of people out there who want to protect me and they mean it all well but what i will say is let them go let them explore like you know nobody's watching just like that I love that, Mel. Thank you. That's really powerful words to end on. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. It's an incredible journey that you're on and it is so, so inspiring. Best of luck with, um, with, the, with the future future walking. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thanks for having me. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Mel. What an adventure, what a challenge, what a woman. Two and a half years on the road, another year to go. She is absolutely smashing it. I'll make sure that I share all of the links to her social media content, especially her Facebook page, so you can go and follow along and keep up to date with her challenge as it progresses. Another podcast episode, I've got two podcast episodes I would like to recommend to you, especially if you're interested in these long through heights. I'd highly recommend you go and take a listen to Sonia Richmond who we spoke to at the beginning of March, March 2nd, 2020. So Sonia is a 42-year-old Canadian who is currently hiking across the across Canada on the Great Trail as well. She's actually walking uh, walking the trail with her partner Sean and they began their journey in Cape Spear in Newfoundland on the 1st of June in 2019 and have hiked just over 3,000 kilometers to Quebec where they are basically just be- where they arrived just before the win- winter. They're going to be heading back out to the trail in spring and they estimate that they will complete their journey in fall of 2022 so it's another episode well worth listening to very different um, perspective of you know walking the trail you know obviously doing it with her partner Mel's doing it with her dog the other episode that I'd encourage you to go and take a listen to is the episode with Lucy Barnard so we spoke with Lucy on June 25th 2019 And Lucy shared more about her goal to be the first woman to walk the length of the earth. So two years ago, Lucy started in Ushuaia, which is the southernmost point of South America. And she has been walking through Chile, uh, yeah, through Chile and Argentina and continuing to push on through the the mountains of Peru and heading up to Panama. Lucy is now coming up to her year three of the journey. It's incredible. By the end, she will have walked through 15 countries and she expects 
expects the journey to take around five years. She is self-supported. She sleeps in a tent. She's responsible for the navigation and logistics. And she's also got a dog as well. There are a few roosters making an appearance in the last podcast episode when we spoke to her, but really well worth listening to. I'd also just give a shout out as well to another awesome podcast that I'm a big fan of, and that is Sparta Chicks and Radio. So Sparta Chicks Radio is hosted by Jen Brown, who we've also had on the Tough Girl podcast, and she has spoken to Lucy twice now. So her episode number 54, where Lucy shared more about walking the length of the world, and then episode 94, which she goes into year two, and I can't remember the episode number, but the, Jen has just recently re- released a third episode, um, catching up with Lucy. I'd really encourage you to take a listen to them. It, it, you know, incredible episodes, an incredible journey, and it's one of the things that I'm trying to do as well through Tough Girl Extra which is to almost uh, make sure that I'm speaking to adventurers as they progress through their careers to see what you know they've been up to and also speak to adventurers and, and amazing women before they go on challenges and then after they go on challenges so you know last year you'll remember that we spoke with Shauna just before she headed off to through Heights Pacific Crest Trail so we spoke to her earlier in the year and then we also caught up with her for Tough Girl Extra so tough um, that episode came out in December but Tough Girl Extra is when I go back and catch up with previous guests of the Tough Girl podcast and also interview members of the Tough Girl tribe to share more about their life of adventure their life of challenge what they've learned and get you know top tips advice from from them so you know recently we've caught up with sarah davis an adventurer who's paddling the length or who has paddled the length of australia's longest river the murray river 2500 kilometers we caught up with dr kate leeming who shared more about cycling nambian coastline a 1621 sand cycling expedition we've caught up with anna blackwell who shared more about her green ribbon expedition um i mentioned shona mcpherson we've caught up with Lindsay cole who, who shares more about adventuring with adhd is swimming the length of the river Thames, um dresses a mermaid um sarah Uton. we've caught up with paula reed the adventure psychologist going knowingly into the unknown melissa yuri we followed melissa's journey for quite a while actually and she was the first woman to complete uberman now if you want to find out more about all the incredible women that we have on the tough girl podcast go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com that is the main hub that is the main website um go and check it out there's more information about me my background there's more information about all the incredible women that we've been interviewing since 2015 there is the tough girl blog and there's also links to a couple of the books that I've written about climbing Kilimanjaro and running the Marathon de Saabs. I do just want to say again a massive thank you to the patrons and supporters of the Tough Girl podcast. The work I'm doing would not happen without these amazing individuals who are donating between $2 and $25 a month. You know, please donate what you can. If you are listening to the Tough Girl podcast on a regular basis, or you're going out for a long run and you're binge listening to five or six episodes at a time, think about paying it forward. If it has had a positive impact on your life, then just think, you know what, what impact would it have if more women heard about these incredible women all over the world, all shapes and sizes, all ages, doing this whole variety of different challenges because this is what it is about. It's about increasing the amount of female role models in the media. When women can see other women doing it, they start to think, hold on, she's just like me. And if she can do it, then what can I do? And so that's my question to you. What can you do? Pay it forward, become a patron, sign up at patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. Have an incredible day wherever you are in the world just give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, say yes, say yes to those opportunities, say no if you want to as well, it is your choice, but just give it a go, do what you want to do, you've got one life and life is so precious, you've got to take advantage of it. All right, lots of love and I'll speak to you soon, bye. Bye.